Welcome to our webinar on I-33 earnings per share. The webinar will just take us through the core principles of the, of the standard and give you an illustration of how to determine uh, basic earnings per share as well as diluted earnings per share uh, for entities that are required to present and to prepare such information. So firstly, let's look at the scope of I-33. It applies to the separate and individual financial statements of an entity that has got shares um, or debt instruments that are traded in a public market or is in the process of seeking such a listing in a public market. And it also applies to consolidated financial statements of such an entity. In many jurisdictions, companies are not required to present but separate as well as consolidated financial uh, information. So therefore, if you are presenting consolidated financial statements, you're only required to compute earnings per share for the consolidated results of the group and not for the separate uh, holding company financial results as well. In terms of just the background to the idea behind earnings per share, effectively it's meant to be a measure of the performance uh, of a company and it allows a comparison of performance between entities uh, that might be in uh, distinctly different industries. So companies and investors can see uh, and make comparisons about the returns that those companies are making, which can be very difficult without a common measure because of the variances in industry. So it's, it's meant to be a way in, in which one can equalize the performance of companies across many different industries and then start to do a relative comparison. It also allows for comparison of performance of an entity within itself, but across different reporting periods. So for example, an earnings per share increase between uh, the current year and the prior year would be a good illustration of increased performance, not just relative to peers, but also relative to its own performance. And of course, it's important that we do it on a per share basis because there could be differences between the current year and the prior year because we may have raised more capital and therefore, whilst profits might have increased dramatically, the earnings per share might have dropped if we financed the growth of that business through the issuance of significant amount of ordinary shares. The main focus of the standard is really on the determination of the denominator, which is the number of shares uh, that are used in the determination of earnings per share. But there are also adjustments to the earnings number uh, but certainly in terms of a focus area, the main focus is on adjustments that are required to the number of shares in issue when you determine earnings per share. Looking at the presentation and disclosure requirements, the companies that do present earnings per share and calculate earnings per share are also allowed to present additional entity specific or jurisdiction spe specific performance figures in addition to earnings per share. So if I may use the example of South Africa, in South Africa listed companies are required in terms of the listing rules of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange to present a figure called headline earnings per share. And that headline earnings per share is calculated by taking earnings per share and making certain mandated adjustment to that number which is set out in a circular that is issued by the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and that is an additional number in addition to the earnings per share calculation required by I-33. It is also very commonplace for uh, listed companies to present other forms of earnings per share measures, which may not necessarily be based on profits, so it could be based on operating profits, or it could be based on EBITDA, or any other subtotal in the income statement, which they believe bears a particular relevance and gives a particular understanding to their performance. So I-33 allows a company to have as many of these additional uh, performance uh, measures on a per share basis that it wishes to have, but none of which may be presented with more prominence than earnings per share. And in terms of presentation on the statement of comprehensive income, only the earnings per share and diluted earnings per share may be presented on the face of the statement of comprehensive income and then all other additional performance figures should be disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. 
if a company does elect to present alternative uh, additional figures to earnings per share, then it is required to also disclose how those calculations are, are done and what methods they have used to determine uh, those additional performance uh, figures that it may wish to, to disclose. So it is very commonplace to see that. And whenever you see any earnings or uh, performance number that is not earnings per share from I-33, you should certainly be curious about what exactly has an entity included or excluded in determining uh, that performance measure. Earnings per share is presented, uh, as I mentioned in our introduction, for basic earnings per share as well as diluted earnings per share, and we'll explore what those two uh, areas are and what are the differences between basic and uh, diluted earnings per share. Earnings per share is also further presented for continuing operations and discontinued operations where this is applicable. So for instance, when entity has applied IFRS 5, non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations, and say for example, the group has a subsidiary which it is disposing of, and uh, it has met the criteria for a discontinued operation in terms of IFRS 5, then it is required to present uh, on a statement of comprehensive income an indication of which profits are from continuing operations, those that will remain within the group after the uh, disposal of the, uh, of the subsidiary, and then the profits relating to the discontinued operations, uh, which would be the operations of the entity that has been uh, determined to be an entity for disposal within the group. So you're required to calculate EPS on those two subtotals as well as the combined EPS uh, as well. Occasionally you may get entities that have got more than one class of ordinary share and we'll speak about that a little bit later in our presentation but if, you, if that is the case then you're required to present earnings per share for each class uh, of ordinary share that the entity might have issued. So if we kick off then with basic earnings per share, an entity is required to determine its basic earnings per share based on the profits that are attributable to the ordinary equity holders of the parent entity. So it's important to remember that most listed entities are, are made up of many group subsidiaries and not all of those group subsidiaries are necessarily uh, owned 100%, which means there's often a participation in profits of non-controlling shareholders, that are those shareholders that are participating as uh, shareholders at subsidiary company level, and there might also be equity holders at the parent level that are not necessarily holders of ordinary shares. And they might be holders of other instruments that qualify as equity. So it's important that we realize that the figure that we're talking about here in terms of earnings is those that are attributable to the ordinary equity holders of the parent entity. And we'll explore how one gets to that figure in the following slides. So basic earnings per share is determined by dividing the profit or loss that is attributable to ordinary equity holders of the parent by the weighted average number of ordinary shares outstanding during the period. So there's our basic formula. It is the earnings divided by the shares. And of course the earnings, we know that there's a specific segment of the earnings that we're talking about. And by shares, we know that those are the weighted average number of ordinary shares. And we'll explore each one of these components in a little bit more detail as we proceed with our presentation. So if we start with basic earnings, if you can picture financial statements and the statement of comprehensive income specifically, ICE 1 requires that an entity or entities determine the net profit after tax and present it, and then show an attribution of that net profit between equity holders of the parent entity as well as non-controlling interests you'll see that we've highlighted that in green. So the equity holders of the parent, that portion is what we've highlighted in green. We then take that profit that is attributable to the equity holders of the parent, and we adjust it further by deducting any effects that relate to non-ordinary shareholders. So it's possible that there might be other instruments in the parent entity that are classified as equity, for instance, preference shares, 
which have met the definition of equity in terms of I-32, but which are not necessarily ordinary shares themselves. So we would make sure that we would adjust the earnings that are attributable to the parent entity, the equity holders of the parent entity, to further strip out any returns that are due to other instruments that may be classified as equity by the parent entity. So we'll explore now what those adjustments might relate to. So for instance, if you've got non-cumulative preference shares that have been classified as equity, the after-tax effect of any preference dividends that have been declared in respect of the period are adjusted in arriving at the profit attributable to the ordinary shareholders of the parent entity. Alternatively, if you have cumulative preference shares, the after-tax effect of any preference dividends that are required but are not necessarily declared. So in other words, they're simply required in terms of the terms of the agreement, but they have not necessarily been declared or going to be paid, are also adjusted for. However, you should remember that to the extent that any dividends are declared that relates to previous periods, those are to be excluded in the adjustments that we'd make for the current period's earnings uh, adjustment. So for non-cumulative preference shares, we only make an adjustment if the dividends have been declared. And for cumulative preference shares, we make sure that we make the adjustment irrespective of whether or not the entity has declared or is able or has the intent to pay a dividend. Because they're cumulative, they're effectively entitled to a dividend participation. And therefore, we make sure that we uh, adjust for that in determining the profit attributable to ordinary shareholders for each period. Further adjustments might also be required depending on the complexity of the entity and the type of instruments that it has. So for example, if you have uh, increasing rate preference shares, which may have been issued with a premium or a discount, and that premium or discount is then accreted to retained earnings over the, um, the life of that instrument, we would also make an adjustment for the annual accretion of that premium or discount in, a, in arriving at the profits that are attributable to ordinary shareholders, although this adjustment is technically happening within equity uh, components and not necessarily going through the profit or loss statement itself. Any premium or discount that might have been realized in the redemption of preference shares is also adjusted for in arriving at the profit that is attributable to ordinary shareholders, as well as any early conversion premiums on convertible press uh, that were converted during the period, those would also be adjusted for in arriving at the profits that are attributable to the ordinary shareholders. So it's quite clear that what we're really trying to get to is that profit which is attributable only to ordinary shareholders, which no other instruments are able to make a claim against. And that is why we make these other additional adjustments which don't necessarily appear in the profit or loss statement because they relate to instruments that have been classified as equity. So oftentimes these effects would be sitting in the statement of changes in equity because there would be transactions with equity holders and there would not be profit or loss items per se. So it is important that you understand what the capital structure of the business is so that you're properly able to make these adjustments as they become uh, necessary in your circumstances. In determining, therefore, what is an ordinary share, it's important for us to consider what the definition uh, is. So an ordinary share is an equity instrument that is subordinate to all other classes of equity instruments. Ordinary shares participate in profits only after all other instruments and types of shares have participated and taken their portion uh, of, of the profits that have been generated in that period. And of course, an entity may have more than one class of ordinary share, as I mentioned in our introduction, and ordinary shares of the same class typically would be expected to have exactly the same rights to receive dividends. So whilst between classes there might be differences, but certainly within the same class of ordinary share, all the instruments within that class would be expected to have the same dividend rights uh, with respect to participation. So now that we've dealt with our earnings and we've clearly identified what an ordinary share is, 
We then need to go a little bit further in, determinate, in determinate, determining exactly what amount of the ordinary share do we include in weighting these ordinary shares. So the weighting that is attributable to ordinary shares is dependent on the date on which those ordinary shares are included in our calculation. So if shares are only in existence for half the year, then they're only included with a weighting of 50%. If they're only uh, in issue for three months out of 12 in a year, then they're only weighted for 25% of the year. So therefore, it becomes very important to determine from which date we should include ordinary shares in the weighting that we have in the determination uh, of basic earnings per share. So the basic rule of thumb is that ordinary shares are usually included from the date on which consideration is receivable rather than when it is received. So it is when consideration for the issue of those shares is receivable. Now oftentimes the consideration for the issue of shares is cash. And if that is the case, then we include it from the date when the cash is receivable. In certain jurisdictions, shares are not permitted to be issued unless the cash has actually been received. And in other jurisdictions, there is no such limitation. So the common theme that we therefore have in EFRIS is that we would include that from the date that the cash is receivable and not when it is necessarily received. If, for instance, ordinary shares are issued uh, by way of a reinvestment of dividends, so shareholders are given an option to reinvest their dividends and be issued with more shares, then those new ordinary shares are included from the date when they are reinvested. If an ordinary share is issued as a result of a conversion of another instrument that is in the business, for example, a convertible preference share, then it is included from the date on which the interest accrual on the prior instrument ceases. So if you have a preference share which is convertible to an ordinary share and it accrues interest at 10%, the date at which that 10% interest stops accruing because you're now in the process of conversion, that is the date on which that share is included as an ordinary share for the purposes of calculating your basic earnings per share. If an ordinary share is issued by way of settling uh, the capital or the interest on a financial liability, again, it is included from the date on which the interest accrual ceases to occur. If shares are issued, as consideration for the purchase of an asset or the acquisition of an asset, then the date on which the shares are included in the calculation of basic earnings per share is the date on which we meet the asset recognition criteria from the respective standard. So for example, if it is an item of property, plant and equipment, therefore it would be the date on which the risks and rewards associated with that item of property, plant and equipment uh, would be met and that then triggers the date on which we would include the respective shares. And if the shares are issued as consideration for services rendered, we would then recognize the shares as the services are rendered. So if we think uh, of an example where uh, services are rendered over a six month period, and in the current period, three months of service received, and in the following period, another three months of service received, in the current year, we would include three months uh, worth of shares that would have been issued because we recognize it as the services provided. And then of course we must recall that we must then wait those shares for the, for the period in which they were outstanding during the current uh, year. So for the first tranche, it would be three months of the 12. For the second shares in that three month period, it would be for two months out of 12. And then for the last tranche of shares, it would be for one month uh, out of the 12th, and then the remaining shares would be recognized in the following uh, period. So one of the things that's very important to understand as a consequence of this requirement is that the issued shares that the entity has at the end of the year may not necessarily correspond with the number of shares that we'll use in our determination of basic earnings per share because it is we are using all of these other triggers which are not necessarily going to coincide with the issuance of actual shares which may be delayed or which may predate the recognition criteria that is set out uh, in I-33. So it's important that you keep that in mind.
oftentimes the date of issue is quite relevant, especially with cash issue of shares, but it's not the trigger date and it's important to understand that for each type of share issue transaction, there's a specified trigger that you need to be uh, aware of. We then also have uh, further criteria for specific type of transactions uh, in terms of at which date we should include ordinary shares as part of our calculation. So for instance, in the event of a business combination, when entity is issuing some of its ordinary shares as part of the purchase consideration for a business, we would include those ordinary shares as part of our basic earnings per share calculation from the date on which acquisition uh, is, is, is made of that subsidiary. And that acquisition date, as you know, in terms of IFRS3 business combinations, is the date on which you're able to exercise control of that entity. So control, the definition comes out of IFRS10, we then have our acquisition date coming out of IFRS3, and that becomes the date at which those ordinary shares are included as part of basic earnings per share. Although it is quite likely that the shares may not necessarily have actually been physically issued uh, at the acquisition date. In the example where you've got uh, mandatorily convertible instruments, those are included in basic earnings per share from the date of the contract in which those mandatory convertible instruments are issued and not from the date of actual conversion. So for example, if you have a mandatorily convertible preference share, which is issued today, but is only going to be convert convertible in 2020. But it is a mandatory conversion, and the only thing outstanding is the passage of time between today and 2020. Those instruments are included as if they were actual ordinary shares from today, which is the date of the contract relating to the mandatorily convertible instruments. And it's important not to confuse this particular concept with the idea of a potential ordinary share, which is something we'll talk about when we discuss the idea of diluted earnings per share. So this is for mandatorily convertible instruments. And R33 says, if the passage of time is the only criteria between now and conversion, then the passage of time is treated as an absolute certainty and the instrument is treated as if it was an ordinary share today for the purposes of calculating basic earnings per share. If we then look at the idea of contingently issuable shares, while contingently issuable shares might also arise, for instance, um, in a business combination setting where a business is acquired and certain profit warrants are required uh, by the vendors of that business before additional consideration is paid. If that additional consideration is going to be paid in the form of shares and the structure of the transaction is such that we will treat that as equity rather than a liability, those contingently issuable shares are included in basic earnings per share from the date that all the necessary conditions are satisfied, i.e. the events must have taken place. And so it becomes quite important to understand the structuring of these type of transactions. So as an illustration, if you acquire an entity and profit warrants are set out as two distinct periods, year one has a profit warrant and year two has a completely independent profit warrant that applies only to the results of year two. And yet you will only issue the shares for both year one and year two at the end of the two year period. If you've gone through year one, and the criteria for the year one profit warrant has been met, and you have not yet issued the shares because you're waiting again to issue all the shares at the end of year two as agreed, you would include all the shares relating to the year one warrant in the calculation of basic earnings per share from the date on which all of those conditions would have been met, even though the shares have actually not yet been issued. So you wouldn't wait until the end of the two years to include them in basic earnings. You would wait for each of the individual periods that have got a distinct profit warrant and you would include the shares uh, where the contingency has been achieved. You'd include them in basic earnings in that year. An alternative structure for contingent shares would be where the profit warrant runs for 
year one and year two as a continuous profit warrant period. Which means even if you are ahead of the run rate at the end of year one, you cannot be certain that you will not have some reversals in year two, which might then make those shares not issuable. So if year one and year two have been structured as a single continuous profit warrant, then you can only include those shares at the end of year two when all the conditions have been met at that time. And so the structuring of these transactions is very important because I'll have a different impact and timing of impact with respect to earnings per share over the warrant period. To the extent that shares have already been issued, but those shares are contingently returnable. So again, this might be the case where you've done a business combination, you have issued the shares, but the shares might be callable if there is a scenario in which certain warrants are not achieved, profit warrants or other uh, contingencies are not achieved, they are excluded from basic earnings per share and treated as if they're not in issue until such time as there's no longer any outstanding event that could give rise to a recall of those shares. So effectively, it is the opposite of contingently issuable shares. So we'll treat them as not issued until there is no uh, event that could cause uh, them to be recalled uh, at a future date. So be conscious of what are the different trigger points specifically for each one uh, of these scenarios that are set out in I-33. There are certain scenarios, for instance, where you can get a change in the number of ordinary shares that are in issue without a corresponding change in the resources that are available to a business. So if you look at all the examples we've, we gave earlier about when to include shares um, when you know you have received cash or you've acquired an asset or you are receiving services from a service provider etc in all of those examples the entity was receiving some sort of resource in exchange for the shares that it was issuing in this particular scenario we're talking about a scenario where this number of shares are increasing but there is no corresponding increase effectively in the resources or the equity of the business. Examples of this could include a bonus issue, capitalization issues, share splits, and share consolidations. So in each one of these scenarios, the number of shares changes without there being any change in total equity uh, in, in the business. In such circumstances, I-33 tells us that we need to calculate basic earnings per share based on the revised number of shares that are now in play. And the way that we make the adjustment is we make the adjustment as if the event, whether it's a capitalization, a share split, or a consolidation, occurred at the beginning of the earliest period presented. So if you think about a typical set of financial statements, you'll have the current period, and then you'll have the immediate comparative period. And in certain circumstances, you may even have a third comparative balance sheet, but you'll typically only have two income statements presented. So in our example, therefore, we'd look at the preceding period and say that the share consolidation has effectively happened at the beginning of the comparative period. So we have an example on the following slide that we can use to illustrate this principle. So we have company A, which has a reporting date of 31 December. It had 100 ordinary shares in issue at 1 July when it, uh, in the current period when it concluded a share consolidation on a 2 to 1 basis, resulting in a reduction of its ordinary shares from 100 to 50. In the preceding year at 1 January, it had 80 shares in issue and it had, during that comparative year, the prior period, had issued a further 20 shares at 1 July of the prior period. So halfway during the prior period, it had issued an additional uh, 20 shares. And that is how we started the year at 100 shares. And those are the same 100 shares that were in issue at 1 July in the current period when they did the share consolidation on a 2 to 1 basis. 
So in this scenario, the number of ordinary shares that we would be using to determine our basic earnings per share for the current period 20x1 as well as the comparative period 20x0 is calculated as, as follows. So if we start with the comparative period, we'll say we have 80 shares at 1 January 20x0 and as set out in the previous slide, we will make as if the share consolidation occurred on that date, which is the beginning of the earliest period presented. So therefore, those 80 shares on a 2 to 1 consolidation would have represented 40 shares. We then have the 20 shares that were issued at 1 July 20x0, which is in the comparative period, also adjusted on a 2 to 1 consolidation basis, which gives us 10 shares. We then make a further adjustment, which is weighting those 10 shares for the fact that they were only outstanding for six of the 12 months in the comparative period, which means it's a weighting of 50%, and therefore those 10 shares become five. So the weighted average number of shares in our comparative period, therefore, is 45 shares. If we then look at the current period, we had 100 shares at the beginning of the year, and those are adjusted on a 2 to 1 basis, and therefore it's a, and they were outstanding for the whole year, and therefore we make 100% weighting, and therefore the weighted average number of shares for the current year would be 50 shares. So that's how one would apply um, the, the requirement that we spoke of in the prior period. Also something to be aware of in terms of this specific scenario, is where you've got a bonus issue, a cap issue, share split, etc. IS-10, which are events after the reporting date, makes an exception to the adjusting and non-adjusting differentiation that occurs in that standard. Whenever you have a bonus issue, cap issue, share split or share consolidation, which happens, whether it happens during the period or it happens after the reporting period, it is always treated as an adjusting event even if it happens after your year end, but before your financial statements are authorized. So in using an illustration, if your year end is 31 December, and in February you do the share consolidation that we spoke about earlier, and then you then authorize your financial statements in, let's say, April of that year, you will present your earnings per share, basic earnings per share, as if the share consolidation had happened during the year or at the end of that, effectively at the beginning of the period that you're presenting and also at the beginning of the comparative period. So it's as if it had happened at any other time during the year and is never treated as a non-adjusting event. So be conscious of this um, because it does give rise to a lot of errors in practice where companies don't take it into consideration. So therefore, if we can recap on how do we determine basic earnings per share? Effectively, we take our profits or losses, as the case might be, that are attributable only to the ordinary equity holders of the parent after making all of the adjustments relating to other equity instruments like preference shares that might have an entitlement to share of profits. And then only once we get to the ordinary shares do we then take that amount and that is the numerator in our equation below. We then divide that by the time-weighted average of the ordinary shares that were outstanding during the period, taking into consideration that they're included from various trigger dates, depending on the nature and the manner in which they were issued. So our basic earnings per share will therefore be those attributable earnings to ordinary shareholders divided by the weighted average number of shares, keeping in mind all of the adjustments that need to be made in order to get to those figures. And that gives us our basic earnings per share. And as a final reminder, remember you may have more than one class of ordinary share. So once you get to this profit figure, if you do have more than one class of ordinary share, you then do the attribution of each class of, you know, to attribution of profit to each class, and then calculate for each class its basic earnings per share uh, as required. Also keeping in mind that you're required to present basic earnings per share for continuing and discontinued operations where such 
circumstances exist in your business, uh, for example, where you have applied IFRS 5. If we then turn to the idea of diluted earnings per share, so entities are required to determine both basic and diluted earnings per share. In order to determine your diluted earnings per share, it is necessary to adjust the profit or loss attributable to ordinary equity holders that we've just spoken about, which we use to determine basic earnings per share, as well as making adjustments to the weighted average number of shares. So in other words, we're making an adjustment both to the numerator in our equation as well as the denominator in our equation potentially in moving from basic earnings per share in order for us to get to diluted earnings per share. And as we did for basic earnings per share, we're going to look at the earnings element and see what adjustments might be required there. And we're also going to look at the uh, denominator, which is the share component, and see what sort of adjustments might be required there in order for us to understand the concept fully. Before we delve into that detail, we should look at two key definitions in order for us to understand this concept. So diluted earnings per share really talks about the effect of potential ordinary shares. And I just again want to highlight something here that is different from contingently issuable ordinary shares. Remember when we spoke about contingently issuable shares, we were talking about basic earnings per share. And what we said there was that contingently issuable shares are included in basic earnings per share when all of the conditions have been met. A potential ordinary share is an instrument that already exists that has the potential to become an ordinary share. And that is something quite different from the contingently issuable share. So a potential ordinary share is a financial instrument or other contract that may entitle its holder to ordinary shares. And when we say that a potential ordinary share is dilutive, dilution is effectively a reduction in basic earnings per share. So in other words, total earnings might go up, but if basic earnings per share would go down, because for instance, you have a disproportionate increase in your denominator being the number of shares in issue, then basic earnings per share might go down. So it's important to understand that what we're testing is the per share measure and not total earnings versus diluted earnings. It is earnings per share that we're testing for dilution. So dilution is a reduction in basic earnings per share or an increase in basic loss per share in the event that you have a loss rather than a profit resulting from an assumption that convertible instruments are converted, that options or warrants are exercised, or that ordinary shares are issued upon the satisfaction of specified conditions. So that's an important thing. So if we go back again to the point that I was making about contingently issuable shares, if we determine that a contingently issuable share has not met the criteria to be included in basic earnings per share because not all of the required conditions have been met, then it becomes a potential ordinary share and may affect diluted earnings per share. So it can't be, it won't necessarily be included in both. So if we decide that it is in basic earnings, we already have it in the number of shares in our denominator. Therefore, when we get to diluted earnings, we don't include it again because it's already included in that denominator at that particular point. If we turn specifically to the earnings and getting from basic earnings to diluted earnings, effectively the way that you would do that is you take your basic earnings and you adjust for the after-tax effect of the following items that relate to your dilutive potential uh, ordinary shares. So for instance, if there's any dividends that are being paid to those potential ordinary shares. So in our example, it might be a cumulative uh, or non-cumulative uh, PREF. If there have been any dividends that have been paid to that, and let's say this instrument um, is, is obviously not an, yet an ordinary share and it has a return, then we would adjust for any dividends that would accrue to that instrument. If that instrument is classified as a liability, not as equity, we would adjust for any interest.
that are, uh, relates to that instrument. Keeping in mind that all of these adjustments are on an after-tax basis. And then it says we should take into account any other changes in income and expense that could result or would result rather from conversion of that instrument from whatever it currently is to being an ordinary share. So what are some of these other changes? And I suppose a good way to illustrate what some of these other consequential changes might be would be to take the example of a convertible PREF. So if a convertible PREF were to be converted, the profits of the business would initially increase because we would save on the interest expense. So let's say that this convertible PREF was treated as a liability rather than an equity instrument. So any dividend that it would accrue would be treated as, an, as interest. So that interest would be saved if it were converted to an ordinary share. Therefore, our profits would increase relative to it uh, remaining as a potential ordinary share. So that would give an increase to that number. However, if profits were to increase and the company has got a profit share uh, scheme, the profit share that employees might have would increase. So therefore, if employees get a 10% share of every dollar or euro or rand or any other currency that, uh, that you, the entity operates in, if they get a 10% share of any increase in profits, then a $1 increase in profits would be offset by a 10 cents, 10% 10 participation or increase in the expense relating to employee share profits. So therefore, we take into account both changes. So in our example, the $1 increase would certainly be added back to those uh, profits, but then we would deduct from that the 10 cents, which would relate to an expense increase relating to employees that have a participation uh, in, in, in the additional profit. So both changes would be taken into account in determining what the earnings number is, and that is before taking into consideration what is going to be the increase uh, in the number of shares, which is the denominator. So you've got to take into account both the direct consequences as well as any consequential changes that might also arise uh, in terms of, of any adjustments required on the conversion of potential ordinary shares to ordinary shares. So how do we determine whether something is dilutive or is not dilutive? So effectively, what R33 asks us to do is we determine that based on whether it is dilutive to profits from continuing operations specifically. And we use continuing operations as our control number to determine whether or not a potential ordinary share is dilutive or anti-dilutive. So I'm going to explain to you in the next few bullets exactly how that works. If an instrument is anti-dilutive, in other words, it would add more to profits uh, on a proportional basis than it would add to the number of shares on the denominator, therefore increasing uh, earnings per share from continuing operations, then it would be treated as anti-dilutive and it is excluded. So really, when we're speaking about diluted earnings per share, we are looking at the worst case scenario for current shareholders, current ordinary shareholders. And we are saying if all of the holders of potential ordinary shares that could cause a detrimental effect to basic earnings per share from continuing operations were to convert, what would that effect be? And we would ignore all potential uh, ordinary shares that would in fact go the opposite direction and be anti-dilutive. So we're looking at the worst case scenario of dilution and not a likely scenario or an overall scenario or a complete scenario. We're looking at the worst case scenario. So potential ordinary shares are considered for dilution um, on a class and issue basis individually. So let's say, for instance, a business has got three types of preference shares, preference share A, B, and C. And given the returns and the terms of each type, they all have different effects on dilution. The way that you would calculate your dilution is you start with the most dilutive instrument first, and you test its dilution versus continuing uh, basic earnings per share. And then you calculate the adjusted continuing basic earnings per share after the dilution from instrument A. You then go to the next most dilutive instrument, which might be instrument C. And then you calculate, well, if you converted instrument C, 
what would be the effect, and then you would calculate the after effect of diluting instrument C and see what that number is in terms of diluted continuing uh, earnings per share. You then consider at that time whether you can achieve any further dilution of that last calculated amount by adding the dilution that comes from instrument B, which is the least dilutive of the instruments. If you added instrument B and it resulted in an uplift, in other words, an anti-dilutive effect from adding instruments A and C initially, then you do not add instrument B. So you only dilute until you cannot dilute any further by adding an additional instrument. And that is how you determine which instruments should be included as dilutive instruments and which instruments should be excluded uh, from dilutive instruments. So whilst individually A, B and C relative to continuing basic earnings per share are dilutive, they may not actually all be dilutive because we will do each one one after the other to see what is the maximum level of dilution that we can get on a step-by-step -step basis. So keep that in mind and also something that is um, regularly done uh, incorrectly by companies. So the number of shares that you effectively apply in calculating your, so calculating your diluted earnings per share is the number of shares that you have in determining basic earnings per share plus the shares that would be issued on the conversion of the dilutive potential ordinary shares, which we've just spoken about in the previous slide. So you would add those shares. And the weighting of that effectively is dilutive potential ordinary shares are deemed to have been converted into ordinary shares for the purposes of cal calculating diluted earnings per share at the beginning of the period. Unless, of course, they were only issued halfway through the period. So in our previous examples, we had, in the previous example that I've just given you, we had instrument A, instrument B, and instrument C, which were all potentially uh, potential ordinary shares and all had elements of dilution. So now we've determined from our previous example that only A and C should be included as, as dilutive instruments because B would reverse a portion of the dilution. We then say, was instrument A in existence at the beginning of the period? If so, it is weighted for the full year. If instrument A was only issued, which is a preference year, was only issued halfway during the current year, then in calculating our diluted earnings per share, whilst it might result in 100 ordinary shares if it was converted, we would then weight those 100 ordinary shares by 50% because they were only issued halfway through the year and so therefore would only increase our, uh, our, our denominator by 50 and not by the 100 because we waited for uh, the date at which they were issued. If they've been in existence in the company in the current year and the prior year, then they are fully weighted and they're included as if they already existed at the, at the beginning of the year in calculating diluted earnings per share. Another peculiarity that you need to be conscious of is the fact that dilutive potential ordinary shares are determined, uh, earnings per share, is determined independently for each period that is presented. So in other words, you, you will not show, if you've done, um, if you're a company that reports quarterly, you will calculate based on the basic earnings for quarter one, whether instruments A, B, and C are dilutive in that quarter's results. So you could find that in quarter one, all of those three instruments are dilutive. And therefore, the diluted earnings for quarter one would include the dilution effect of all three instruments. Then you would do quarter two results. And based on the basic earnings of quarter two, you might find that only instruments A and B are dilutive to the results of quarter two. And only A and B would be included in the calculation of diluted earnings per share for quarter two. And so it may go for each of the quarters. And the same applies for a full year versus the comparative year. So in the comparative year, all three instruments, A, B, and C, might have been dilutive relative to the basic earnings of last year, whereas based on the basic earnings of the current year, only instrument A might be dilutive. So for each period, the dilutive potential uh, ordinary shares are determined on a distinct basis. The other thing to be very conscious about in determining the dilutive effect uh, 
is also to consider how many instruments would be issued as ordinary shares if a potential ordinary share were to be converted. So for example, depending on the terms of the potential ordinary share, a convertible PREF might be convertible into one ordinary share. So in other words, it could be a one for one, it could be a one for two, or it could be a one for 10 or any other number. So you have to be conscious of the conversion ratio because that's going to change the relationship between the amount that you add back to earnings and the number of ordinary shares that you add to the denominator, which gives you the net effect of dilution. So you need to be conscious that instruments that convert on a one-to-one -one basis are going to be probably less dilutive than instruments that convert on a one-to-many basis. And uh, make sure that you take that into account in doing uh, your computation. As an additional concern, you also need to be conscious of the fact that a subsidiary, a joint venture, or an associate may issue to parties that are other than the parent, the venturer, or the investor. Of course, a parent in the event of a subsidiary, a venturer in the event of a joint venture, and an investor in the event of an associate. Those entities may issue to parties other than the main investors potential ordinary shares which are convertible either into the ordinary shares of the subsidiary, JV, or associate itself, or into ordinary shares of the parent, the venturer, or the associate. You should also take into account such potential ordinary shares to the extent that they would be dilutive to the group uh, basic earnings per share amount. So that's an important consideration to be taken into account in calculating your diluted earnings per share. So folks, that's really the, the summary of the standard. Effectively, what we also should take into account in terms of determining the order of dilution, strictly speaking, you would generally tend to look at instruments such as warrants and options, which are unlikely to add an amount to the numerator, which is the earnings, but will add an amount to the denominator, which is the number of shares when exercised. And so typically, in terms of the order of dilution, you would do warrants and options first, and then you would do other instruments such as prefs, uh, convertible press, etc., second and third, depending on the level of dilution of those instruments. So warrants and options are generally the most diluted first, and then you would do the rest uh, thereafter. So I-33, relatively simple standard to understand once you've gone through the training and you understand all the different rules that apply to it. Keep in mind, every entity must present basic and diluted earnings per share, and um, also must present basic and diluted earnings on continuing operations as well as discontinued operations to the extent that such items exist.